Once again, good morning. Welcome to week number one of our new series, Where is the Love? April 15th, 1965. Not just another regular tax day. But on that day, uh, a song that has been remade, sung over and over and over again, 150 plus times was released for the first time. Now, I know some of you are probably way too young. You've never heard the original version, but you, you probably heard the song that was first sung by Jackie DeShannon. Anyone? Well, here it is. I'm going to try out for the band right now. Jonathan, don't listen. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just. Ah, very good. How did you, Jonathan? He's shaking his head out there. Nope, that's it. He's off the list. 150 plus times that song has been reproduced, put on an album, recorded for the world to hear. In fact, there was a a group of, of famous singers who did it just last year. Which wouldn't shock you, right? Uh, we live in a world right now where, where people would, would hear those words and say, Amen. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's that one thing that there's just too little of. And that's why we're doing this series. It's timely and timeless. It's timely because 55 years have passed since that song was first recorded. It's been done 150 plus more times. And, and I would pitch to you that as much as the 60s were the time of love, peace, and happiness, and it should have changed everything, nothing has changed. There's still too little love in the world in which we live. It's timely and why we have to answer the question, where is the love? It's timeless, because at the end of the day, in this world in which we live, from the time God put it all into motion to the end, it's been all about love, God's love for us and, and the love that we look forward to celebrating. But truth be told, it, it's not just timely and timeless, it's also going to be tricky. Because to answer that question, we're going to have to wrestle with things that, that so many people in our world forget. It's tricky because in this world, some people call something loving and other people call it hateful. Some people's definition of love and, and another person's definition of love are, are not one and the same thing. So, so really getting it right to understand where is the love, what is love, how do we know love when we see it? How do we deal with hate when it happens? It's so important to get it right. And on a day when so many people wake up smiling to celebrate love, the love that a mother has, it's, it's only fitting for today that we're going to wrestle with that part of love, the definition. What is love? If the world needs more of it, as the songwriter put on paper, and, and so many have sung, how do we find it? What is it? So that when we see it and, and in our lives, others will see it too. And now in order to get this right, to answer that question, where is the love? Some people in our world would say, the real issue is the haters. So let's deal with that. Like, let's talk about the people who, who live hate, who, who love tension, who create problems if we can address the hate in the world, then we can deal with so many of the problems. And I would tell you that while we need to deal with that, it's not the foundational place to begin in order to, to get this right and understand the truth. Because if you don't have the right working definition from God on what love is, you're always going to get it wrong. And that's why I, I love that we can dig into God's word and and go back to perhaps the most famous section in all of scriptures about love that the people have heard on love, that, that's read at weddings and, and a centerpiece for, for many conversations in, 
the relationship of marriage, that, that God has an amazing thing to teach us about what love is so that in our life, more people will see it. And not just a little more, but they'll see a lot. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that, that one page in the book that everyone kind of knows on love was not written to married couples. It was not written to, to be a marriage text. It was actually written to a dysfunctional group of Christians. <laughs> like, if you want to look for the most dysfunctional church uh, in the New Testament, Corinthians and, and, and their church would have been at the top of the list. In fact, if you read it from beginning to end, God's question to them over and over again might have been that. Where is the love? Like, you guys are celebrating the Lord's Supper, but you're doing it your own way, and you're doing it at your own time. You're not coming together. You're excluding other people. Some of you are even getting drunk while you're doing it. Where's the love? You have someone in your, in your church who, who's violating God's gift of marriage in, in such an ugly and distorted way, chapter 5, but none of you has said anything about it, brought, brought it up. You're, you're kind of looking at it and going, okay. And God would say, where's the love? Speak the truth. Call it out. And then the chapter right before chapter 13, God talks about spiritual gifts. He talks about the body of Christ, how each person has different gifts, different talents, uh, and all of them are needed. Some are more visible. Some are, 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 are things that people look at and identify as great. Some are more behind the scenes and they don't stand out. And just like the body has many parts, they all serve a purpose. They all have, have value. They all are important. They, they all matter. But you Corinthians are, are mocking the ones that aren't so pretty, you're minimizing the ones that you need, and you're glorifying the ones that you have at the expense of others. Where's the love? And right at the end of that chapter, chapter 12, God says, in the midst of all that, desire the greater gifts. Like, seek to, to have spiritual gifts, grow in your gifts, desire the greater gifts. But even as he says that, he ends the chapter with this verse. And now I will show you the most excellent way. Like, desire the greater gifts, but I want to show you something better. In fact, I want to show you the most excellent way to, to serve people, to, to serve God, to love. I'm going to show you the number one way to live. And that, my friends, is the setting for what you find in chapter 13. Not a hey, husband and wife, but a Every last Christian, here's the most excellent way. And then God's going to explain in a few short verses what his definition of love is for you and for me. Now, oftentimes we overlook verses 1 through 3 and we get right to 4 through 7, all the descriptive words that we like to, to talk about. But verses 1 through 3 of chapter 13 actually set the foundation for God's definition. Now, look how the Apostle Paul goes on after saying, I'm going to show you the most excellent way. He says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. The Corinthians desired the, the greater gifts, and one of the greatest gifts was the ability to speak in tongues. They, they held it in high regard. And, and Paul said, it, if you have that amazing gift, but you are without love, you are lacking love, it's like taking the symbols and just banging them and banging them and banging them. Like, it serves no purpose. If I have the gift of prophecy, like if I can translate God's word, understand it better than others, and can fathom all mysteries and of all knowledge. If I have a faith that can move mountains, like I can do amazing spiritual things, my faith is that strong, but if I have a faith that can move mountains and I do not have love, I am nothing. Meaningless. Like you can do amazing things, great things, have these amazing gifts, but if you lack love, nothing. Nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Like you can do the most amazing acts of kindness by the world's definition, gifts of generosity, sacrificing of body and of checkbook, and, and if it lacks love, nothing. See, God needs you to know the world needs to understand, we as Christians need to, to realize it, that, that our definitions of love, the world's definition of love, 
is not necessarily the same as God's definition of love. And there are two truths in there that I need you to remember. The first one is this. God uses the word for love that is maybe one you've heard before. It's agape. Agape was the highest form of love in the Greek language. Greeks had four or five words for love. They had friendship love. They had uh, erotic love, the uh, attraction love. They, they had fondness love, uh, the, the things that you like. But, but agape love was the highest form of love. It wasn't fondness. It wasn't friendship. It wasn't attraction. It was none of those things, which makes it so different than, than how most people think of love. Because let's be honest. Most people attach love and show love when and only when other people show them something. Love. Like, let's be honest. It's really easy for me to love my wife when she does nice things for me. It's really easy to love my kids when they don't talk back, do their chores, are, are kind to their siblings, and really apply themselves in school and get good grades. Like It's really easy to love people in your life when they, they act the way you want them, when they meet your expectations, right? Is that how you define love? I love you when you are good, when you do nice things, when you are kind, but I don't love you much when you don't. You see, that helps us understand better the word we're going to hear. When you hear agape love, here at 922, we call it you first love, like the other person is first. In fact, if you dig deep into that word, it's got so much meaning into it. It's a love that seeks the welfare of those who are utterly unworthy of any kindness or concern. Like when your kids are unworthy of your kindness and concern, when you're when your kids and their behavior causes you outrage or disgust, God would say love, agape love, still acts, still does. That's agape love. It, it's love that has the, the best of the other person in mind, the best of others in mind, not your own best, but them, you first. That acts and does, even when the other person isn't worthy of it. God would literally say, based on these verses, he would tell you this, love are actions without love, agape love. Like verses 1 through 3 declare some of the greatest actions, greatest gifts, greatest things you could do. Actions without love, God would say, are of no value. They're nothing. They're nothing. Like you might give away all your money and some charity might use it for good purposes, but... It's of no value from the, the spiritual sense. It's not filled with love. And when I unpacked this section, I, I took two shots to the heart. Like, like the first one is, sadly, how many times in, in my life have the things that I, I have done, the outward acts, been done with my own best interest in mind, my selfishness in mind? Like, just take some of the most minimal of things. Like, there are times when I, I do chores around the house just because I, I want my wife to, to look at me and say, he's really a good guy. I really like him. I, I don't just do it to do it. And, and, and that's important. Because sadly, all too often, our motivation drives our behavior, and, and we think it's love that drives it, the emotion, the friendship, the fondness, but, but that's not what God describes with agape love. He actually says it's nothing. And then I think of the last year. Like, there were a whole lot of things that disgusted me, angered me, like people's behavior, that news station's reporting, I don't know what side you're on, or or how you feel, but, but I found myself pointing a finger a lot and having conversations a lot, maybe even wanting to post a lot in ways that weren't loving.
We need to remember that in order to get that right. We need to pray we remember when we ask the question, where is the love? Instead of pointing the fingers in every other direction and, and, and wanting them to figure it out, we need to point it at our heart and our motives and our, our sinful nature that, that sadly and so often it is anything but loving. Seeking the, the welfare of others, putting others first, even the unlovable. Like, it's easy to love your neighbor when they, they get their snowblower out and take care of your sidewalk. It's easy to love your boss when they speak well of you to their boss and you get a raise. It's easy uh, to love your friend when, when they do nice things for you. And, and it's easy to love your kids and your spouse and the people closest to you when, when there's kindness on display and actions that, that you deem as loving. But, but God would say, look at your heart and sadly see the times when there were actions without love and, and know what God says about that. Which is why I'm so thankful that when it comes to God, you and I never have to question, where's the love? Well, the Apostle John knew it. He described it. John said this in 1 John chapter 4. This is love. Like John just cut to the chase. He laid it out there. You want a definition? You, here's how you best understand what Paul is saying. This is love, not that we loved God. We were not worthy. We were not deserving. Uh, the things that we have done, the sins that we've committed are disgusting in the eyes of God. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God looked down on this sinful world, a world filled with hate, and he loved. God looked at your heart and my heart and, and sees actions that are motivated by, by selfishness, and, and he sent Jesus to be selfless in the sacrifice for you and for me. If you want to see what love looks like, if you want to know what love is, if you want God's definition of it, Actions without love equal nothing, but, but Jesus' actions, what Jesus did, his, his perfect life, when he checked every box of the words we're about to hear, patient, kind, didn't keep a record of wrongs, always trusted, he persevered to the end, even when it required his last breath, that love of God, love in action, God's love in action, for you and for me, gives us the definition. It means everything. Like, love in action is everything. When there are actions but no love, it's of no value. But, but love in action, that sacrificial love, that selfless love, the, the love that seeks the best well, and the welfare of, of others, that kind of love, love in action is everything. And for you and me, it was. Jesus did that even though we were unworthy. He loved. He loved. And I think it's one of the things that, that I so love about a Mother's Day celebration. Like, if there's anything that maybe gets close, I mean, we try and understand the lens of God through the Father, but if there's any love that's modeled in, in this life that's always seeking the best welfare of others, even when it's undeserved, it's the mom. <laughs> like, mom, just love. Like, I know what my kids have done, and, and I know how my wife feels about it, and Five minutes later, my son could come in the room after really antagonizing, and he goes, Mom, I love you. I'm sorry. Oh, I love you too. I'm like, get your act together right now, dude. <laughs> like, you know better. <laughs> no, we're not forgetting this. <laughs> there are consequences. It's okay. <laughs> like a mom overlooks. Parents love. As best example we can find in this life, it might be a mother's love. But even that is imperfect. It's not the perfect love of God. And, and God needs you to see what his love is like in order for your definition of love to be modeled and understood and applied. Love in action equals everything. That's what the Apostle Paul would have you remember as he writes those words. Love with no actions is of, is of no value, but but love in action equals everything. 
And when we get that right, when we understand that to be true, when we celebrate that love of God that, that paid the price for your sins and mine, for every hateful thought, for every hateful word, for every loveless act, then we can apply this reality of what he describes for you as love looks like, what love in action really is. Some descriptive words that many have memorized. The Apostle Paul said this. In fact, in, in this section, the word love is only used once. So it's kind of like love is the, the most excellent way and all these things are, are subpoints under it. They, they all fall in that category. None is greater than another. They just are all part of the circle of what love is and what love looks like in action. Love is patient. Uh, literally, long, uh, love is long-suffering. That's what patience is. Uh, patience is, is understanding that when you're five yards ahead in life of the person you want to do life with and they can't get it and they're not able to get up to the same place as you, you come back to them and you journey forward together. It, it, it's painful, it hurts, but that's what you do. It, it endures, patience. Love is kind. The acts uh, that, that, are, that are nice, that are, the acts that are gentle, the, the acts in life that, that simply do because you long for someone else to be blessed. Love does not envy, it's not jealous, it does not boast, puff oneself up, it, it's not proud, look at me and, 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 and look at all my accomplishments. Love is not self-seeking, it does not dishonor others, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Like, there's a four-week sermon series on those words alone. Pastor Jim might have to take up a four-week Bible study to just unpack each and every word, make it really practical for you, help you understand it better, what that could look like in your life. Because love in action equals everything, Jesus says, through the Apostle Paul. Now, we don't have that much time today, so I'm going to take all those terms and boil it down to two general concepts so you get it. When God defines what love is, love in action that is everything, it is these two things. It is tough and it is tender. Tough and tender. Like maybe the, the illustration of a mom and a dad will help you understand love that's, love that's tough and tender. Like the first time you rode your bike and, and you started pedaling away without the training wheels and you took a digger, the first one there was your mom. She brought out the antiseptic spray. She... She kissed it, she rubbed it, she washed it, she bandaged it. That's tender love. Are you okay? You know what dad did? Get back on the bike, let's go. Like, this is the way you do this. You have to get over it. You have to conquer your fear. That's, it's both, right? Love is tough and tender. And here's the thing. It's a great thing about, about homes. A lot of times dads are a little tough and, and moms are very tender. But moms and dads, I need you to understand you need to be both. Like a mom that's only tender and never tough is a pushover. And a dad who is tough and never tender will never ever let his child see the love of Jesus, the love of God as a leader that is spiritually invested in them. Like you need both. You need to be both. And trust me, I know that I'm not. Like when my son says things to me like, like, Dad, grades are the only things that matter. You don't love me even if I get a bad grade. I'm like, that's not true. And sometimes I need to balance the tough, like expectations with the tender of, I love you simply because I love you. You might not even deserve it right now, but I'm going to love you. You need both, Dad. And moms, you need both. And in our Christian walk, in the world in which we live, we need both. Like, you can't just be a Christian who rejoices with the truth, with righteousness, and hammers the Bible and says, Jesus was tough. He tipped over the tables. Like you, you need to also understand that the other side of the coin is Jesus was tender and he, he got down on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet the night before he died. Like you can rejoice with the truth and stand up for the truth, but, but you shouldn't celebrate injustice, evil. And, and you shouldn't just look at it and say, that's bad. Love would, would act and, and consider the ways that, that you can make a difference. Like, like God says it's not one or the other. You need both. 
in your homes. You need both with your neighbors. You need both in your community. You, you, you need love that is patient, that, that can be tough, but it shows that you're tender. Like, do you see how both those words describe it? Because here's the thing God says. Love and action is everything. Love that is tough and tender will make a difference. If the, if the world saw that love that it needs a whole lot more of right now, you know what God says about that love? This is not Pastor Tim making it up to try and sell you a bill of goods to, to make a difference in your world. No, this is God, through the Apostle Paul, speaking that kind of love. Uh, a Christian who is both tough and tender, who balances it right, who lives it out. That kind of love, God says, never fails. The love of God that was both tough and tender, Jesus who was tough and tender, God who is tough on sin but tender in sending his son, that love did not fail you and it did not fail me. It did not fail anyone. That, that love of God models tough and tender, love in action, does not fail. Which means when God says we love because he first loved us, if you love like that, if you live like that, if you are both tough and tender, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. They will see it. They will question it less because they'll see it in you. Which is why I want you to remember that. That kind of love never fails. It will bless your home. It'll bless your, your coworkers. It'll, it'll bless our community. It'll bless our country. So what on the list would you look at and say, I need to work on? Or I need you to work on my heart and, and help me put love into action because it's everything and stop having actions without love. I know in our pastor's meeting, we, we asked each other, you know, how would you grade yourself on love? And I looked at the list and I'm like, patient? No. Keeper of record of wrongs? Yes. Do I like to boast sometimes? Probably. Do I always trust and believe the best and not assume the worst in people's words? Nope. Do I also always persevere? I have been known to give up at times. Like, I, I, there are things I need to work on. But by knowing the definition of what love is, I don't want to stop working at it. And I know that God who, who loves wants you to love. So I want you to look at the list. I want you to start every day this week by reading through the list, patience, kindness, not keeping a record of wrongs. I want you to think about how in that day, every day you're going to show love and action to the people you, you live with, the people you're connected to. Like if you can do that for a week, if you can let God's definition of love seep into your heart, you know what people will say in our world? They'll, they'll, they'll say less of the question, where's the love? And they'll see more of the person who is love, Jesus Christ. And you know how I know you can do this? Because right after John gave us the definition, he gave us this promise. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God loved us. And God calls us to love. If what the world needs now is love, sweet love, what you know and who you have in your life, Jesus and his love, which means everything, can be put into action by you. It will mean everything to helping the discussion of how do we address hate by letting people know and see what love truly is. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. I thank you, Lord, that you did what you did in spite of me spite of all of us. A world filled with hate, a world filled with people who didn't deserve it, and yet you acted, and you came, and Jesus, you died. And that love and action means everything to us now and for eternity. And Lord, I pray for our church. Uh, we live in a world, in a community, we have homes and neighborhoods where people are hurting and they don't, don't see that love. So Lord, let us be that. On a day when we celebrate moms and their love, Lord, we thank you for, for brothers and sisters in Christ, for moms and dads, for, for Christian homes and Christian family and our church family where, 
where we get to show and share the love of Jesus. And Lord, help us see and, and keep your promise that that kind of love, when we put that love into action, which means everything like yours for us, that kind of love won't fail. So Lord, bless us in that. And we pray for this, Lord, in the one who came to love and the one who has shown us love.